I was just going to just briefly say what Cadeco is because and we don't have too many left, but we um, not many people might be aware of what the Horizon Europe stream of funding is. So we are funded by the EU, um, the European Union for ICT research. So EU every year will launch a couple of uh, calls for proposals around specific thematic areas where consortia come together, different industry, uh, different um, companies from industry and academia, and will apply for these funding calls. Typically last about two to three years and worth multi-millions of euros for people to carry out research on specific areas. So that's what Cadeco is. And I said we actually are working on a number of other projects that were presented here today and I'll, I'll mention them in, in a little moment. So uh, I also want to just give a little bit of an outline of who we are. So both myself and Alka work uh, out of Red Hat Ireland. We are a, just recently have actually officially become a research interest group as part of Red Hat Research. And what that means is what the research interest groups do is they focus on trying to foster uh, research, carry out research, aligned with Red Hat's strategic interests and open source vision. So what does that really mean for us? What do we, what do we really want to do under that? What we want to do is take Red Hat projects or the upstreams of Red Hat projects, problems maybe or known issues or known areas we want to focus on in those projects, products, bring them into the EU fund, into the EU research, carry out research on those, carry out novel research, and then hopefully take the results and bring them back into our upstream projects and then back into our products. So it's that sort of a cycle where we, we take our problems, we bring them into the, into the European Union funding model, we carry out research and we bring them back and actually it benefits everybody. So we're only relatively new, we're well, six months it says there, but we're closer to eight at this stage. So we're a very new entity, we're 10 people as of this week. And we're currently uh, working on four EU projects of this size. So two of the others, AC3 and INCO, were presented today. And you can, I'm sure you'll be able to see the recorded presentations online if you're interested in those. And we have another one in the, uh, both in hybrid cloud and we have another one in the EU data spaces, or in the data spaces area. Just to say, as a bit of a plug, if anyone is interested in any of the topics we're talking about here today, we're very open to collaboration. We're always interested to talk to people who are working in this space and have expertise in this space to help, uh, to help bring us along. The areas of focus that we're looking at are hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, IoT and Edge, and like everybody else in the world, AI. In particular, there's another big AI funding call coming later in this year that we'll be, we'll be focusing on. Okay, very quickly, what we'll discuss today, I'm going to give you an overview of Cadeco. We'll talk about the, some specific use cases that we're looking at within the EU project. We'll talk about the architecture. We'll dive a little bit more into the key components of that architecture and where Red Hat is involved. We'll talk a little bit about what we're, what, where the current state of the work is and what's next steps. We're about one and a half years into a three-year program. At this point, actually, I just want to call out, as you'll see in a second, it's a fairly large consortium. Those people are bringing areas of expertise they've been working on for years. We are working on a specific part of that, so we don't have the depth of knowledge about all the components that we're going to be talking about here today. So if there's something that you see that interests you, feel free to catch up with us afterwards. We can put you in, talk, in contact with the partners who are actually executing that work, and we can, we can uh, facilitate some conversations that way. Okay, so this is just the consortium. As you can see, there's some pretty big names there. Uh, we have our from across academia and industry, we have our colleagues in IBM, Eclipse, Siemens, we have Atos, Fortis, so a fairly uh, list of very, fairly well-known names within academia and within, um, within industry. Okay, so getting to Cadeco finally. What is Cadeco? Well, based on the project proposal that I may or may not have read yesterday, Cadeco is a cognitive cross-layer and highly adaptive edge cloud management framework with a unique uh, orchestration approach. That, and that sounds lovely, I'm sure you'll all agree, but what does it actually mean, right? So I suppose the core aim of Cadeco is to try and, um, is to try and place or to try and manage and deploy workloads across a cloud edge infrastructure in an optimal way, right? So the key phrase there is optimal, right? What does optimal mean, especially in a cloud edge um, infrastructure? And the three words I've tried to highlight there kind of speak to, to, to what we're trying to achieve. The first one is cognitive. And I, again, no prizes for guessing what cognitive means uh, in, this, in our current environment. Cognitive obviously means AI, right? So there is a, a large AI component around 
how we actually take and place workloads across those uh, edge infrastructures, cloud edge infrastructures. So we're not just doing it in a static way based on predefined or well-known criteria. We're trying to use a learning approach to go, well, where is the optimal placement of these services based on things we're observing and, things, and models we're building based on those observations. Uh, Cross-layer then speaks to what are the things we're observing, what are we using to drive those decisions. So we're looking at the data, um, the data considerations. We're looking at the compute considerations network considerations, and then the application itself. And then one other thing we're also considering is uh, non-functional requirements that the user can specify in how they want their actual application to be managed and distributed, right? The big one is energy, because that's a real core theme within the EU about how we, 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 do ener how we manage energy and how we are making sure everything we build now considers energy from the outset. So how do I distribute workloads across a cloud edge infrastructure that, that, ta that uh, takes into consideration the energy constraints? of that specific application. OK, just a little bit more. I think we've probably covered most of this. But the main thing to call out here is that the, far, the framework and architecture that's being built within Codeco is, uh, is generic. It's aimed to be applied anywhere. It's a high-level architecture initially. But obviously, once we come to implement that and bind that to a specific platform, that platform is Kubernetes in terms of what we're building now. So everything we're building at the moment is very much focused on, is very much tied to Kubernetes. Uh, we're, and most of the com main components are built as operators with their own uh, CRDs within the Kubernetes um, platform. There's nothing else I need to focus on here. Uh, use cases. So I suppose first and foremost, within any of these projects, uh, th what we need to consider, or what, what we always have to do in the new projects, is take our solution, the thing we're building, and try and apply it to known problems within, uh, within society, be they industry or otherwise, right? So that's, that's what use cases are done to do to prove the value of the thing we're trying to build. So we're looking at a number of them across uh, six, six of them to across different uh, thematic areas, all really look, focusing on things like, you know, remote edge devices with unreliable connectivity, low latency, real-time applications where we may be monitoring large volumes of data and need to manage that uh, and process large volumes of data. Uh, the nodes themselves might have variable, variable processing capabilities, uh, and the applications may have various processing capabilities as well. Uh, scalability, obviously, within, a, within an edge uh, scenario is, a, is always of high importance. So smart cities, looking at traffic and, and, pub, and um, pedestrians. Vehicular uh, safety, looking at making digital twins of both users and vehicles based on roadside units, where we can actually try and develop, uh, understand and get insights on dangerous activities that might happen and alert users. I'm not going to go through them all because I'm probably already going over time for Alka, but um, one in particular that, that I just highlighted here is a smart city use case in Germany, in Göttingen in Germany, where we're looking at monitoring pedestrians to understand uh, using a, uh, LiDAR and thermal cameras on edge nodes to try and understand user patterns, user traffic flows, user pedestri or sorry, pedestrian flows uh, within the city. So that can feed into things like real estate companies, property developers, city planners, to understand how they uh, maybe invest in the city, how they develop the city, based on identifying what the patterns in, uh, of, of users are within the uh, pedestrian users within the city. OK. Pretty much my last slide, just to give a first touch on the main components of the architecture. So the, there's five key components, as you can see. ACM is the one that we will be working on mostly that, that Alka will talk a little bit more about. Uh, that stands for automated configuration management. It's the starting point of the system. It's where we interface with the user. We take their specification of what the application is and those non-functional requirements I mentioned, and we actually try and deploy that out. We, we, we uh, interface with all the other components to pass down the relevant information to them. We take care of things like monitoring and, and multi-cluster management. MDM is the data consideration, so that's uh, trying to capture all the data requirements of the application and uh, basically just auto-discover the data sources within the environment so that we can take things into consideration like what are the actual data requirements of the application, should we move this uh, pod from here to here because it's reliant on data source, as a real time, uh, maybe it's a streaming application when we don't want to, you know, we don't want to uh, in increase latency on the network link because uh, by moving it from the data source. PDLC stands for Privacy Preserving Decentralized Learning Context Awareness Component. Thank you very much. Uh, it's the brain of the system, so it's basically trying to gather information from all the other components and uh, make uh, and learn based on that to make 
uh, intelligent decisions and intelligent recommendations on where we should put workloads. SWM then is the scheduler. It's built on top of the existing Kubernetes scheduler uh, to factor all those data inputs coming from PDLC to try and more intelligently do, do the scheduling of those workloads. And then finally, NetMA is the network, right? So that is monitoring the network. Um, monitoring the network, discovering the network topology, creating network links, virtual network links between different uh, nodes so that we can, cr uh, we can communicate cross-cluster. Uh, and basically, that will feed in, like most of the other components, into PDLC for helping us to make decisions. Okay. So, on to the overall architecture itself. Which point? I hand over. Okay. Oh, you don't want to? Sorry, sorry, that's my fault. So, this is just, I've, I've kind of gone over um, most of the components here, but this is just a, a deeper dive in how they all interact. So, as I said, ACM is the core component where, the, where we interface with the user. As I mentioned, it's talking about the deployment of the application, we're focusing on the monitor, monitoring, pretty much using Prometheus. Uh, we're talking about uh, OCM uh, for the multi-cluster management. We're not actually building multi-cluster at the moment. It's not how the project is structured, but I think Alka might mention that in a moment. So that we interface with the user. User specifies what their application is, what the requirements are, what it looks like. We take that, try and instantiate that into a set of uh, Kubernetes resources, and ask our, 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 the other components then to place that effectively within the, within, based on the, the intelligence they've built within the system. MDM, the, the data management. So really, that's based on a, a, a semantic data catalog that tries to auto-discover data sources within the, within the um, infrastructure, be they CRDs of the applications we deploy or other data sources such as a relational database or, or any form of data source, really. That's done through building out connectors. PDLC, that is the, as I mentioned, the, the brain, the learning brain of the, of the, of the system. It's, it's split into a couple of different uh, pieces depending on the actual core function it's trying to do. Privacy preserving learning is the main one, so that's really where we're looking at two different types of learning techniques in terms of reinforcement learning models and also uh, GNNs in how we come up with, effectively what that really wants to do is come up with a set of weightings, almost of scorings of the nodes that we're going to place our workloads on based on the different optimization criteria that we're looking at, whether it's energy efficiency, security, whatever those requirements are that, we're, that we're, we're, the application is, is, is um, focused on. Then SWM is the scheduler, so the that once PDLC makes those recommendations or decisions, it passes the information to the scheduler, and the scheduler is trying to multi-optimize those different uh, considerations. So we could have multiple rankings based on the different optimization things, uh, criteria we're looking at, and the SWM tries to, to, to basically bring that together into a, a, into a workload uh, placement strategy. And also reacts then based on what's happening. Sorry, I, did, I just realized I did miss a, a key phrase that was on the pre, one of the previous slides about adaptive, right? So the other point here is once we make a placement, it's not one and done. We're also trying to continually learn, re-monitor the, the infrastructure, adopt, update our models in line with that, and then try and make new placement suggestions based on what's currently happening within, the network, within our infrastructure more specifically. And then NetMA, um, as I said, there's a number of parts there. It's using Alto for, for network discovery. It's a software-defined network uh, controller. It's using L2SM for creating virtual links between the different nodes so that we can have actual communication cross-cluster between, uh, between different pods. And I think that pretty much covers the architecture. And now I think Alka is going to take over for the, and go into the core components in more detail. Thanks, Ray. So now I'll be diving into the core components of Kodaiko. So first we have the PDLC, which stands for Privacy Preserving Decentralized Learning and Context Awareness Component. So it has basically two sub-components. First one will be the context awareness, and second one is the decentralized learning component. So what PDLC CA will does is it will actually collect all the metrics from different components, and it does the pre-processing. That means cleaning up the data. And finally, uh, passes that output to the second one, which is the PDLC DL component. So what DL will do is it will does the model selection and training of the data that it receives from the CA. And uh, there are actually two main models that it will be using. First one is GNNs, which is the graph neural network. So uh, 
And second one is the reinforcement learning. So GNN actually provide the predictions for the resource consumption for the nodes. And the reinforcement model will uh, actually use these predictable values to generate the node recommendations. So basically, it will give you the best nodes where the application will be placed. And we have the MLOps pipeline, which will help to interact, which will handle the interaction between these two models, the GNNs and the reinforcement learning. And finally, the outputs, which are the node recommendations, will be passed over to the SWM component for doing the actual scheduling or rescheduling of the workloads. So as an overview, uh, what PDLC does is it collects and analyzes the data, and then it does the training and learning based on the AI, and it generates the outputs, which are basically the node recommendations, and it will pass the output back to SWM, and SWM is the one who actually uh, takes the decisions, uh, that is actually does the scheduling or rescheduling of the workload. And finally, it passes the feedback back to PDLC, so PDLC can compare the uh, actual actions that SWM takes and uh, what PDLC suggested. So it, can, it will compare both of them and it will allow the PDLC to improve in the future. So next we have SWM, which is basically the scheduling and workload migration. Uh, so it does two things. The first one will be the initial workload deployment, the monitoring and migration. So SWM decides where each port should run and on which node inside the cluster. So that will be based on the application model, which reflects the user requirements. And the second one will be the efficient placement of applications. So that will be based on the information from PDLC. So once SWM receives information from PDLC, it will place the application so that there will be low latency or uh, there will be low energy consumption, and it will actually achieve all the QoS requirements from the user. So basically, it provides a match between the application requirements and the available resources. So the four main functionality of SWM will be the initial placement of workloads, as we discussed in the previous slide, and then the dynamic placement of app workloads. That basically means SWM will reschedule the applications whenever there is a change in the conditions. So by conditions, I mean, for example, whenever there is uh, new components or new applications are added, or whenever there are uh, applications that are removed or changed, or there are changes in the infrastructure or the user requirements. So a rescheduling will take place. And uh, the third one will be the app workload deployment and redeployment. That means the workloads are actually executed on the selected nodes. And SWM will take care if there is any failure that occurs. And finally, the app workload migration. That means moving a workload that is currently running on a compute node to another compute node. And SWM will take care of that. That, so that's all about the SWM. And next component is MDM, which stands for Metadata Management. So all it does is the data orchestration. That means it collects the data from different components, and uh, it uses that metadata. So what metadata does is it provides a complete view of the data and uh, the various characteristics of the data. That means uh, where is data stored, how it is structured, so basically the schema where it is uh, originated, how it is classified and protected, and so on. And next, we have NetMe, which stands for Network Management and Adaptation. So it automates the network resource management. It does the network monitoring, um, basically collecting all the metrics that is related to the networking. And it does the uh, performance management, network performance management. So that, that will be done on demand. Uh, that means based on external triggers or uh, based on the user request. And then it exposes all the networking metrics to other components. So that will be done periodically or on demand. And it acts as a pri uh, primary connectivity mechanism. So that means it handles the secure connectivity between the ports. So that's all about Netomy. So now we'll discuss where do we fit in. Uh, so Red Hat was working on the component called ACM which stands for Automated Configuration Management. So ACM actually handles the user input. So it, that means it provides an interface between user and Codeco. So basically, user can uh, actually specify the various requirements, various application requirements via the uh, Codeco application model, so that, it can, so that user can control the various configuration details about the application. And uh, second one is Codeco Automated Configuration. So that means 
uh, whenever ACM receives a user request for the application deployment, it activates all the Kodeco components, and then it configures them by passing the user data. So this will be done by using the CRDs or CRs and the Kodeco operators. So basically, CRDs means uh, custom resource definitions. Uh, they are basically definitions for the custom resources. And then we have operators, which are basically the extensions of uh, Kubernetes. So these operators will be always be monitoring the custom resources for any changes and react accordingly. So we have the cluster and federated cluster configuration. That means basically handling the Kubernetes, Kubernetes infrastructure based on the instructions that is received uh, by the ACM. And finally, we have secure monitoring framework. And uh, this is all about handling the metrics across the Codeco platform. And this will be uh, based on a tool called Prometheus. So what Prometheus is, it's an open source monitoring solution. And what it does is uh, it collects the metrics from different targets periodically. Uh, it evaluates the rule expressions. It displays the results. And it triggers alerts based on specific conditions. Next, we have the uh, Kodako installation. So ACM operator is the only operator that is exposed towards the users. So when user installs the ACM operator, it will trigger the installation of the entire Codeco platform. So currently, we have a temporary solution based on the CLI, where we will uh, just use a single command to install the entire platform. And uh, in the future, we will use the OLM, which stands for Operator Lifecycle Management. So that will be integrated so that it enables us to install the platform as a single Codeco operator. And what was done so far? So we have built and deployed the Kubernetes operators by using the Go programming language. We have implemented the unified deployment, as we discussed before. Uh, we have the monitoring framework working for a single cluster. And we have defined the detailed app model, which we'll be discussing in the next slides. Uh, and we have created a CRD based on the model. And we have implemented the interface to other components so that uh, components can actually communicate with each other, like data can seamlessly flow between the components. So now, what is an application model? So it's the way in which user communicates with Codeco. So there will be a dashboard GUI from, uh, through which the user can actually specify the various requirements. So there will be specific YAML files, which is a CRD, which will be created from the user requirements. So there are basically two sections in the application model. First one is a spec section, and then there is a status section. The spec section actually uh, refers to the input to the ACM that is provided by the user. And the status is the output from ACM that is provided to the user. So spec actually uh, represents the desired state of the application. And uh, in the status, we have all the metrics information about the application status. For example, the runtime failures. That means the information about the uh, resource usage. For example, the average CPU usage, memory usage, or the energy consumption. And also, we have the application configuration details or deployment details as well. So this is like a sample UML model, sorry, UML diagram for the application model. So as you can see, the application is the core entity of the model, and we have the spec and status section. So in the spec section, we have specific parameters for the application, and then the microservices, because an application can consist of multiple microservices. And then we have specific parameters for the channels. Channels uh, are the ways through which microservices communicate with each other. And then in the spec section, we have three kinds of metrics. We have the app metrics, which is at the application level, and we have the service metrics at the service level, and we have the node metrics at the node level. So for example, if you look at the CPU usage, we have the average app CPU at the app metrics level, and we have the average service CPU and average node CPU as well, respectively. So now we'll discuss how data is flowing between the different components, uh, how they are integrated. So first, uh, first step will be the user specifying the requirements to the application model or CR. And that will uh, respectively trigger the ACM operator. So ACM operator will map out all the user com parameters to other components CR. So whenever there is a change in the custom resource, then that will trigger the respective operators of the components. 
and the further processing will be done by the components based on their functionality. So that depends on the individual components. So for example, if ACM is passing some data to the SWM, then SWM will deploy the application because the SWM operator will be triggered by these changes in the CR and finally it will schedule the ports in the cluster. So for demonstration, first we have the user who specifies the application configuration details to the CR YAML file, which represents the application model. And this will trigger the ACM operator and ACM operator, which copies this data to the corresponding CRs, will trigger the corresponding components operators. And we have the monitoring framework installed along with the ACM inside the cluster. So this is basically the Prometheus operator, which will connect with the Prometheus server. Uh, and Prometheus is like a data store for all the metrics. And these metrics will be pushed back to the status section of the application model. So that user will get a, over, an overall view of the application or how application is performing inside the cluster. So these are the various technologies used in ACM. So first, we have the OCM, which stands for Open Cluster Management. So that's a commit-driven project, which is the upstream project for Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management. We have the Kubernetes API extensions, which are the CRDs and the operators for Kodako installation. We have Prometheus for monitoring Ansible for the automated deployment of Kodako. Then K3S and Microshift, which are the lighter versions of Kubernetes Hypershift for provisioning of Kubernetes clusters on remote worker nodes. So as of now, we have completed the 18 months of Kodeco, and we have implemented the single cluster operation of the, of the, of the project. So now we'll be focusing on the multi-cluster management. So that will be based on OCM, which stands for Open Cluster Management. So this is like the second phase of Kodeco. So we have a cloud-based shared environment, which is for the large-scale testing and demonstration purposes. And it will assist in further development in the multi-cluster environment as well. So uh, we will be looking to modify the application model for the multi-cluster. And uh, there will be improvements in the current monitoring, in monitoring framework as well. So that's all. And if you can search for Kodako HE, our project website will pop up. And you can view all the details of the public repository or the coming uh, community events as well. So that's it. Thank you. So if any ha anyone have any questions, we can. So I think the, the question relates to exactly what parameters we're using in terms of the optimization of the placement um, across. Is it just CPU and memory, or is there more really to it? Yeah, there's more to it. Now, again, just like I called out at the start, we're not actually working on the on the modeling part of this. But for sure, the 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 solution is aiming to capture as many different types of optimization parameters as we can. So CPU and, and RAM are kind of, they're, they're givens, really. Like, it will be looking at network optimization, or sorry, network latency, the current network latency of the, uh, within the um, infrastructure. As I said, it's looking at the data considerations, what the type of data is, the currency of the data, you know, what, what the requirements of the data are for the user, uh, on the user, and what the applicant, or on the application, sorry, and what the app, what the user specifies in terms of their requirements of the application. So we have the user wants, uh, you can see it here, the user wants, say, has a, a failure tolerance limit that they want to specify. You know, it, it, at the moment, there's simple, they're simple metrics like high, medium, low, for instance, right? So they have, their, their application has zero failure tolerance, or it has a, me, a moderate failure tolerance. 
we want to apply energy limits to it in terms of, again, high medium, we're comfortable using X amount of energy or, you know, we want a really low energy limit. There, there are uh, a range of other ones. Security, again, it's something that we haven't really delved into yet, but this, how we can say whether this, if this is a high security, you know, it's a banking application or it's something like that, or it's, it's a public no PII, no personal information, and so the security considerations are low. So there's, a, there's a, a range of metrics we're looking at that would be provided from the user, and then, uh, then obviously there's a range of values that we'll be monitoring from the infrastructure, as you said, including network characteristics such as latency, as I said, the data considerations, um, at the energy usage of the, actual, uh, of the actual infrastructure itself as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, for generalizing the kind of magic that we already know in the application and by representing the application itself and mapping it to your app. Yeah, yeah. When you say model, you mean in terms of the, the capturing the, the definition of the application. Of the, oh, okay, excellent. Yeah, yeah. The PRs that we are using to define how the components of the application are connected to each other or what are the QS communication of this. Okay. No, that's a, that's a really interesting observation. Yeah, thanks for that. We'll take a look. Okay, thank you. Okay, nothing else? Okay, well, thanks very much, everyone.